Yeah, awesome, great. Yeah, thanks for everyone uh, for coming in. If you would like to introduce yourself, feel free to do so in the chat. Uh, but if it's all okay with everyone, we, uh, we're happy to uh, get the meetup rolling because I believe we have most of the people that we're, uh, that we're in the waiting room in the meetup right now. So um, welcome. Uh, you, for for those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, you know, welcome for the first time. And if you're joining us again, uh, we welcome you back. Uh, this is the June edition of uh, Amy's AI Meetup. Uh, uh, my name is Vanimir. As as mentioned, I am the marketing and communications associate here at Amy, tuning in from Edmonton, Alberta. Um, so. Amy is one of three centers of excellence as part of the pan-Canadian AI strategy uh, with a history reaching back uh, to decades of, of world-leading AI research and training that has uh, put us on the map as one of the most, um, uh, sorry, right, one of the global leaders in AI and ML. So whether you are involved with a business or you're a student or you're a prospective student, or if you're just looking to uh, get involved in the AI community to learn a little bit more about the work that's being done uh, within the Alberta uh, AI ecosystem, we, we welcome you to uh, reach out to us. We'd love to connect. Uh, we will include a, a contact uh, email uh, at, the, at the very end uh, if you would like to reach out to Amy to learn a little bit more. Or if you're interested in speaking at a future AI meetup, that is also, uh, um, uh, would be, we'd love to hear from you. But a few housekeeping notes before we get started here. This meetup is being recorded. Uh, so uh, we will have this meetup up on our YouTube page as soon as possible. So everyone can view it and revisit it at their leisure. Uh, I don't know if we have any international uh, participants uh, in the room today, uh, which is always amazing when uh, that, uh, you know, the, the it's, it's three in the morning and people are attending uh, a meetup like this. Uh, but, you know, these meetups will also be recorded and put on our YouTube page. Uh, so, you know, you don't have necessarily have to stay up at till three in the morning to uh, to view this content. But we, you know, welcome you anyway. So uh, you can expect this uh, meetup to be uh, approximately about an hour and a half. But we are also excited to see your faces. So uh, we encourage you to keep your camera on throughout the meetup so that our presenters can see you, so that you can uh, gauge your reactions. It's always it's always very tricky to uh, present uh, through uh, a sort of a digital medium like this. So. We welcome you to, uh, to be present with us. And finally, as we continue to improve these virtual events with each iteration, uh, you can expect a small uh, a, a survey within an email that will be sent to you as soon as possible after uh, this event. And uh, we'd love to hear uh, what works, what, what doesn't, what you'd like to see. Uh, we wish to hear your feedback. So uh, it'll help us out a lot to make events like these better with each iteration. But housekeeping aside, uh, we have two great presentations for you this evening. Uh, there will be a quick question and answer period at the end of each presentation uh, for any questions that you may have for our presenters, uh, at which point you should be able to uh, ask your question either by unmuting your microphone or asking your question in the chat. And I'm happy to uh, read out any questions that are uh, uh, sent through the chat. So if that sounds good with everyone, I say let's jump into the content. Uh, so please, uh, I'd like to welcome our first presenters, Faraz and Mirav uh, from Entwist. Uh, so a warm welcome to you both, as this is the second time uh, that we welcome Entwist to the AI Meetup. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. And, and Faraz, uh, feel free to uh, kick Brittany off here, because uh, if you share your screen, then uh, that slide will go away. Should I share my screen now? Yes, that should be good. Yeah, okay. Oh, uh, can everybody see this? Okay. So I think we can begin, right? So hi everyone. Hello everyone again. Uh, so again, my name is Faraz, and uh, today I'm going to be presenting uh, on computer vision, uh, recent developments in computer vision, and how it can be used for you know applications and industries, right? So before I begin, I just wanted to give a brief insight into our company and twist. Uh, our main vision is to bring machine learning into as many facets of uh, process industry as we can. 
right? As many of you would probably be aware of, machine learning has recently really taken off in the past decade or so. And as a result, many different fields and companies have taken to applying machine learning for their own applications. However, in many respects, process industries and industries in general have uh, really been behind the curve and they still are. So our main aim is to kind of educate our customers about what uh, is possible with machine learning and you know provide solutions uh, with this regard. So with that, uh, we'll just begin. So this is the main outline of my presentation. Uh, we'll first discuss some general computer vision uh, topics and show you what it can do. And then after that, we'll move on to some specific examples in industrial computer vision. And then finally, we'll close off with discussing what all of this means, right? So let's begin with the first part of it. So firstly, of course, what is computer vision? So computer vision is basically is just uh, kind of giving computers the ability to have a high level understanding of digital images. On a very basic level, it just means you kind of automate any sort of visual task that you are doing manually right now, right? So for example, we have image classification as a part of computer vision where we have an image and the computer vision algorithm classifies it into different object categories. We have object detection where it kind of localizes where the object is located as well. And a more advanced version known as semantic segmentation and instant segmentation where each pixel in the image is classified as an object. So you get exact location of that particular object in the image, right? So a natural question out of all of this that arises is why is computer vision, uh, you know, hyped up so much right now? Well, very recently in 2015, uh, an algorithm known as ResNet uh, was used uh, to classify objects on a data set known as the ImageNet. Uh, sorry, I'm just having some problem. Yeah. So it was used to classify Im uh, a data set known as ImageNet, which has different objects in it. And ResNet was used to classify these object categories in those images. Surprisingly, ResNet actually outperformed human vision in this test. Right, and that is absolutely incredible if you think about it. Uh, so human vision in most cases is pretty accurate, but in some cases we have our own perception and biases. And sometimes the images were not clear or they were obstructed and hence this led to, you know, ResNet actually outperforming it. So based on this in 2021 recently, Tesla announced that for their self-driving cars, they'll be completely doing away with their radar systems. So again, when you think about it, radar has been around for decades, right? It has been optimized for decades. And in spite of this, Tesla is now trusting their self-driving cars, the safety of it, the whole concept of it completely to computer vision. So that is why it has really kind of taken off and it's very trustworthy and you know hyped up right now. So uh, just as a general uh, algorithm, so I'll give you an example of a general computer vision algorithm and what it can do. So there is this ResNet that we discussed on the previous slide. Uh, it's a sort of neural network, a more special form of neural network known as convolutional neural network. And we have images which are fed to this neural network and it performs three different tasks. Firstly, it has a region proposal network in it, which kind of proposes or finds where the object of interest might be in the image, right? So it will find this region, which might correspond to a road. It will find this region, which might correspond to a bench, a tree and so on. So currently it does not know what it corresponds to. It just proposes uh, regions of interest. Then at the second stage, we have a classification task where each of these proposed regions are then classified into different object categories, tree, bench, person. Right, and then at the final part of it, each of these objects are then further localized. So each pixel in the image is then classified according to what object category it belongs to. So at the end, we receive something like this, which is a bench and each pixel has been recognized uh, very accurately where the bench is located. So to give you a demo, one of my colleagues Nirav here will give you a small demo regarding what the output looks like for mass car CNN. So uh, Nirav, can you please stop sharing? Thanks for us. So, just... so right now what's happening is, uh, uh, by the way, can you guys see this? Can you see my screen? So what's happening is uh, the algorithm that for us just explained, I'm just running it in my laptop. So what it is doing, it's taking uh, the images from the webcam live 
and it is feeding to this algorithm. It is doing all the detection and classification on the go. Unfortunately, since uh, I do not have a GPU graphic process unit on my laptop, it's pretty slow. So it updates every 10 seconds, but uh, uh, you can literally see it takes the image and uh, now it says, it says the object that it sees through those, uh, through my webcam. That's why I'm holding my cell phone. <laughs> so, so I can show it to you guys. It also says like how sure it is, uh, this being a cell phone. So not, right now it's 99% sure that it's a cell phone or it's completely 100% sure that uh, like when it is classifying me as a person, it's 100% sure. I have a couple of uh, bottles lying in the background, uh, which it is uh, successfully classifying. So uh, as far as I explained, it, it does three things. First, it identifies the part of the image where it thinks that there is a possibility of uh, having an object. Uh, once it identifies those, uh, those parts, it creates a bounding box around it. Um, then uh, it performs the classification. That means what the class of the object is. And then it creates this pixel perfect mask, uh, which, uh, which gives like the pixel by pixel classification of where the object is. So back to you, Faraz. Thanks, Philip. Uh, yeah, so I hope that was uh, exciting about what computer vision can do, right? So now that we see what it can achieve, uh, let's shift our focus to more how we can apply it in our process industry or industry in general. Right? So in most industries, we have physical sensors such as temperature sensors, pressure sensors, you know, mass flow rates and so on, which are installed in the industry. They take measurements from the field and they kind of communicate this measurement back to the central control room where the operators can see what the current uh, values are, right? So a natural question here is, can we leverage these recent developments in machine learning and computer vision for use in process industries, right? And the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, all it requires is a cheap and inexpensive camera, uh, inexpensive in comparison to like physical sensors. And these cameras, uh, they can be installed in a very safe and non-intrusive manner. So it does not require a shutdown to be installed. It does not require any sort of special safety features or anything like that, right? And uh, once these are installed and we run our algorithms on it, these cameras can be used as sensors, like any other sensors. You get a measurement and you can use it for either measurement or you know monitoring, or you can use it for closed loop control. So Again, uh, we won't give a specific example to give you an idea of how, in what situations uh, computer vision could be used in process industry. So let's say, for instance, we have uh, a product that is dependent on the lab. So, you know, operators take samples from the field and they send it to the lab where the lab kind of carries out their tests and we get a result of what the product quality is, which, is, which would be after like two or three hours. So now the problem is in those two or three hours, we do not have any idea about what the product quality is, right? So in that particular case, uh, in most cases, the operators can actually look at the product visually and based on the visual quality of the product, they can actually say qualitatively whether the product is you know, of good quality or bad quality and so on. So naturally in this case, of course, this sort of, uh, uh, you know, procedure is uh, tailor-made for computer vision. You can apply computer vision and you can get a sort of online measurement of your product quality as long as you take regular snapshots of the product, right? Then uh, another case might be where the sensors are unreliable and we'll see an example of this later. So sometimes the sensors are in uh, direct contact with the process fluid and they have certain, you know, uh, you require maintenance. It sometimes has downtimes and so on. So where feasible computer vision can be applied there. And another example is, let's say the we want to measure something that is kind of non-measurable by physical sensors. So let's say you want to calculate or find the trajectory of the injection site of a particular fluid, right? So we want to find the trajectory and that could be, again, uh, computer vision could be used there. Uh, one more personal experience that I've had is with expensive measurements. So uh, sometimes in many industries, we have these tank farms where different chemicals are located. And, you know, there's a lot of risk for uh, leak of these chemicals, which can be dangerous. 
And in many cases, if you want to install physical sensors for this sort of leak detection, it's very expensive because we have different chemicals and each needs its own physical sensor. Whereas if you have an infrared camera, for instance, it can be, you can apply computer vision algorithms for a general sort of leak detection, right? So it's, it's very inexpensive compared to physical sensors sometimes. So how computer vision works is very simple. It's just you take uh, regular snapshots or images of what you want to measure. You apply your algorithms on it. And once you apply them, you get a certain measurement back. And this measurement again is sent to the control room where operators can see it. And once operators receive these measurements, they can do whatever they want, just like with any other sensor reading, they can use it for control or monitoring. So I just want to give now specific examples where it has been applied before and uh, where we are currently, another example where we are currently working on a project as well regarding computer vision in industry. So this is a example of a primary separation vessel, which is used in the oil sands industry. It is used to separate bitumen from the oil sand. So how this works is that the bitumen separates out from the oil sand and there is an interface form between the two. And this interface is what you want to track. Now, traditionally, uh, industries use uh, differential pressure cells or they use nucleonic profilers for this purpose. However, because the fluid is very dirty inside the PSV or the primary separation vessel, uh, many times they get choked up and they give inaccurate measurements. So in these cases, the operators had to kind of manually look through the side class here and monitor this level and you know control it. So of course, this is inefficient and computer vision was used here to kind of automate this process and you know use it in closed loop control for downstream pump uh, flow rates and so on. Right, so uh, I'll give you an example of how it is used uh, in for this particular purpose. Uh, just Yeah, so we have these side glasses here, four of these present on the vessel surface. Uh, these, uh, this yellow part is the oil sands part and this darker part above is the bitumen part. Now we want to track the interface level between the two, right? And here you can see that the algorithm is able to track this level as it goes up. So I'll just slowly skip ahead because it's a two minute video, but uh, you can see as it goes up, it's able to track it. Now there are certain challenges in which there is some staining on the side glass, for instance, here, uh, these places, and we want to be able to differentiate the interface from that. So there are certain special challenges which you have to overcome. And as we can see, as it goes up through the side glasses, it reaches the sand stuck regions. And when it goes into the next side glass, again, we are able to track the level in the next side glass as well. So hopefully you can see how it's able to automatically monitor the level. And then, you know, of course, once you have this, you can easily control it and, you know, use it for further operations. So this is one example. Another example where we're currently applying is uh, we have one of our customers who have, uh, who kind of mine this mining material from a certain site and they send it to this hopper here. Um, this, yeah, they send it to this hopper here. And based on the quality of the mined uh, material, operators then decide to add a certain amount of water to this mined material, right? Now here, again, they rely mostly on their own vision uh, to ascertain what the quality of the mine is, uh, mine material is, and then add a certain amount of water. So of course, this process again is, you know, uh, very conducive for applying computer vision. So we can separate out this image into three different red, green, and blue channels, uh, apply certain algorithms on it, and kind of give the final output. Now here, one of the uh, biggest, uh, I would guess, uniqueness of this project is that we have one more data source uh, available for kind of predicting what the quality of the mine material should be. Uh, this is based on some GPS data and so on. Uh, however, this data source is not very accurate. Uh, but in this case, since we have a computer vision sensor and we have another sort of sensor, this model, we can combine the two and we can get better inferences about what the product, uh, what the mind material quality should be like. So 
as I mentioned, this is a feature of computer uh, vision, uh, especially in industries where we do not need to replace the existing architecture, it can be used to augment the existing architecture as well. So this is another example. Right? Uh, based on the previous two examples that I've given, uh, the benefits of applying computer vision in industry should be quite uh, clear. We have standard and unbiased measurements from computer vision algorithms. Uh, I mean, human vision is an amazing tool, obviously, but it's uh, everyone's perception is might be slightly different. We might be looking at the same thing, but might be seeing something else, right? But here with computer vision, it sees what it sees. So the results that you get is standard, standardized and unbiased. And that could be, that is why ResNet kind of defeated human vision as well, which I discussed in the earlier slide. Also, it is cost effective. That is, once you install a camera, it just runs. It's very low maintenance. It does not really require that much, uh, you know, uh, messing around with. You just run it uh, once, and then it just continues running. Finally, we have safe operation with uh, computer vision. So, for example, the leak detection example that I gave earlier, that uh, you can use, uh, uh, you know, cameras installed there for kind of detecting the leak quickly. And also even the operation of the camera itself within the industrial environment is uh, pretty safe. Uh, it does not really require any sort of special precautions or anything like that. So those are the, some of the positive sides of it. There are some challenges, obviously, uh, as with anything in life. Uh, so we have certain challenges with computer vision as well. Uh, image quality is important there. Uh, so for instance, if you use a very low resolution camera, it might be a problem. So we need some image uh, quality. And obviously with larger, uh, with better image quality, you have larger uh, data storage requirements as well. Then we have training data variation where, you know, you train your computer vision algorithm on a certain subset of images. However, when you're actually testing it in the field, the actual uh, circumstances might be very different or it might encounter very different uh, circumstances. So again, there we, we would have a lot of false positives or you know, false negatives. Uh, another factor is the uh, issue of annotating the images. That is when we make a training set, we have to create labels for them. So let's say we have an image with a chair, a person has to kind of manually label the image that you know, there is a chair in this image, there is a, you know, a football in this image or whatever. Right, so this process takes a bit of time. Uh, it's a manual process. And because computer vision algorithms have huge architectures, they also do require a lot, large amount of data. So, you know, labeling this large amount of data does take some time. And then finally, we have operationalized the integrated solution challenge as well, where, you know, there are different components to computer vision and kind of putting them together to work as one unit for a whole project could be challenging and it does require experience and you know, knowledge. So finally, I'd just like to discuss what all this means. Uh, so as we showed with our old composition example, uh, computer vision is a small part of the whole uh, ecosystem, right? So uh, we have all these different sensors already present in the plant and adding computer vision kind of adds to the information that you get from all of these uh, different sensors as well as computer vision to better inform the operators about how they should operate the plant or whether if they make any changes, how does it affect the plant and so on. So it's just a small part of the whole thing, uh, but together they can you know, uh, help run the plant much more effectively. So, uh, that would be the end of my presentation. Uh, I'd like to thank you for you know patiently hearing all of this. And if you'd like to have you know ask any questions, you can reach out to either me or Nirav, who helped me with this presentation, and Grayson as well, who helped me put this presentation together. Also, I'd like to give a shout out to Amy for giving us this opportunity to present you know in this very good forum. And uh, yeah. So that would be the end. So if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I, I believe everybody in the room should have the ability to um, unmute themselves, ask a question if they would like. Alternatively, you can 
put a question down in the chat. Um, there, if, there was a, a comment from Aron earlier, uh, and this was, I think, when Nirav, you were doing your a phone demo, um, and there was some curiosity about how that would perform in a more novel environment like a park. Can you can you speak a little bit uh, more to that? Yeah, I mean, it uh, it is uh, trained to practically uh, work on any sort of objects. It's something uh, that I have not personally trained. It was trained on millions of uh, millions and millions of image, so it can work under different setting. Uh, the goal behind uh, having that uh, demonstration was that you, I mean, same thing is possible for any other object if we have some specific object. I mean, this is what computer vision is capable of at, at this moment. Uh, but yeah, it can it can definitely run in any sort of an environment as long as it sees the uh, the objects that it has seen in the in the past or while it was trained, it can classify, classify it very efficiently. Awesome, Faraz, anything to add to that? Yeah, uh, that sounds good. So basically, I mean, whenever you solve captures online, you're basically kind of labeling the images for them. So they have a huge amount of images for their own training, right? So there's the algorithm has seen all of it before and then once it has seen it, it can you know, detect it in any context. Yeah. Excellent. Um, do we have any more questions? Um, I have a bit of a general question. Oh, wait, we have a question from Marcus. Marcus, please, the floor is yours. Oh, no. Um, sorry, I cut you off. Ask yours first. It's fine. Mine, mine is a bit more general, but if we're still going to talk a little bit technically, then uh, 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 please, please, uh, the floor is yours. I talk a lot in this, in this speed up. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, I was just wondering uh, what tools would be used in the current industry to write the software needed for CV, like we saw with the or composition sensor, like could, mm. if, 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 you, if you know it all? Yeah, so I mean, one of the most important things for most industries is that they want whatever you're coding it in to be open source, right? So that kind of leaves things like MATLAB out of the question, even though MATLAB has a pretty good uh, image processing or computer vision package. So most of these codes would probably these days obviously be written in Python. Uh, Python has like two or three packages which are mostly geared towards using uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning. Uh, you know, there's PyTorch and there's TensorFlow. And both of these are pretty good in terms of offering what uh, could be done in terms of computer vision. And most of the codes that you would probably find online for things like this is also probably written in Python, uh, in TensorFlow or PyTorch. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Thanks for that. Awesome. Uh, okay, well, I, I'd like to ask uh, one more question if there isn't one. Um, I'm just curious uh, more generally about the, uh, the TNET and twist. Um, can you tell us, uh, tell us a bit more about uh, what that's like, what it's, what it's like to be uh, working at Entwist? And if somebody would like to reach out um, to collaborate or would like to learn more, how, how will they be able to, to do that? Yeah, I mean, uh, so, we have a machine learning team which kind of works on these individual projects. So something like the old composition sensor. And uh, we have all these different projects that you know individual people are working on, uh, including me and Nero. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, so we are working kind of independently on all of these projects and you know, it involves quite a lot of research as well because each problem that you get there are special challenges associated with it. So it is kind of like you're doing research for a particular project, right? You're learning new things and you're kind of trying to apply them and see where it goes. So like the whole uh, de demo thing that we had with the you know bench thing earlier, that would be very good for a general, uh, let's say application but for let's say industry where we have some amount of limited data or we have uh, you know other challenges associated with data storage there has to be some sort of uh, compromise there uh, in terms of what we could use or what we could apply right so in terms of that yeah it's mostly we are doing our own individual research 
Yeah. And if uh, obviously if any of you want to reach out, please note down the email. We'd be happy to answer anything. Excellent. Thank you for sharing. If there aren't any more questions, uh, uh, please join me in, in thanking uh, Faraz and Nirav from Entwist uh, for sharing their expertise with us this evening. Thanks so much for, uh, for your time and for joining us. So mm -hmm. now that we are at the halfway point of the meetup before uh, uh, Shana takes the floor, I would like to open up the floor myself to ask if anybody has uh, any sh any uh, newsworthy things to share to the group, uh, so that uh, might include what you're working on, uh, if you're working on any exciting projects, or if you have any exciting news on behalf of yourself or your research or your organization that you would like to share, uh, whether you're hiring, whether you're looking to be hired, whether you're looking for mentorship. This is a great chance to uh, raise that awareness if you are uh, looking to uh, connect more with the community and the work that's being done here. So if anybody uh, wants to take a quick opportunity to share an opportunity, uh, so uh, please do. Uh, I, I can do so uh, before anybody else. Uh, we are hosting an info session here at Amy on Tuesday, June 22nd at 1 p.m. And this is uh, to talk a little bit more about the supply chain AI West accelerator program. So this is a program uh, for early stage startups uh, that are working on AI powered supply chain products and solutions. And so if you would like to learn more about the program, uh, do uh, check out the info session uh, that will be hosted by Adam, who is the uh, product owner of our st uh, startup stream. Uh, I will post the link in the chat for anybody who might be interested in registering for that. Uh, info session, which will happen during the lunch hour. So I will, uh, I, I, I would like to share that. Would anybody else like to take the opportunity to share something exciting? And that's okay if you don't. Yeah, all right, well, uh, we can keep the meetup rolling. Uh, so I am very, very pleased to introduce our next speaker, Shauna uh, from uh, Northwest College. Uh, we uh, thank you for joining us uh, this evening. So please, Shauna, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I'm just gonna share my screen here. So um, I just have a quick presentation to talk about the Machine Learning Analyst Diploma. Um, it might sound kind of boring being a diploma, but this is actually the result of uh, several partnerships and a lot of work that's happening uh, behind the scenes in post-secondary in Alberta in general. If you uh, want to follow along and provide feedback or Q&A or comments as I move along, you can go to menti.com and use this code and you'll be able to interact with the presentation and some of the polls that are embedded into it. So um, again, my name is Shauna. I'm the uh, technology program founder at Merquest. Uh, and as part of this program, oh, it's, there we go. So this program is the result of the AI Pathways Partnership, which I'm also a coordinating and project lead for. Um, and the AIPP is essentially a consortium of four um, post-secondaries, so Norquest, Concordia University of Edmonton, Athabasca University, and Bow Valley College. Uh, so Norquest and Concordia were in Edmonton, and then AU um, and Bow Valley College are in Calgary and Southern Alberta. And essentially the whole point of this partnership is we're working with Amy to create educational pathways into artificial intelligence and machine learning and data analytics. Um, I think we hear a lot from businesses um, that there's, when it comes to machine learning and AI education, there are uh, software engineers, master's students, people with PhDs. Um, below that, there's not a lot of educational opportunities other than things like postgrad certificates or taking a few courses here and there. So this, um, this partnership is what allowed us to develop the machine learning analyst diploma and machine learning analyst is also somewhat of a new job position or new role 
and we're actually working with industry to put together occupational profiles for those roles because AI and machine learning are somewhat newer industries. There isn't a lot of consistency when there comes to titles and roles and job descriptions, et cetera. So we're trying to help industry standardize that as well. It makes looking for workers a lot easier. It also makes training them easier as well. And this entire project is funded by the federal government over a course of three years or several years actually. So we'll be having a lot of things come out of this. This is the first one. So the diploma itself is your standard two year diploma. So there's four terms, five courses per term. Um, we're trying to meet industry's need for entry level workers. We had several uh, industry engagement events last year. So we talked to CEOs of companies, we talked to uh, specialists and experts, people actually doing machine learning or in machine learning roles to better understand what they do and what the skills gaps are. And what we heard a lot is that there's not a lot of teams with individuals who understand both the technology um, as well as the business fundamentals that go behind answering business questions using by developing machine learning tools or models. Um, and you might not see this type of need in larger companies or in AI specialized companies, but as you start to see more startups or small and medium enterprises try to use machine learning, this is the type of role that we're training for as someone who can help them understand things and um, run their projects or work with companies who are in the AI machine learning space to create solutions for their business. We're also doing a new type of work integrated learning uh, in the form of a course, and I'll touch on that in a bit. And uh, this program itself, the diploma, ladders into the Bachelor of Science in IT at Concordia University or into other business programs, like for your business degrees. And that's part of that pathways part of the AI Pathways Partnership. Um, we are working on more programs so that anyone in, from high school all the way to a master's student has educational pathways through the partnership. Uh, the diploma is kind of the middle ground, and so it's coming first. Uh, if you're interested, this is all on the website, but I thought I'd throw it up here. This is what the program architecture looks like, uh, but you can see there's a lot of business courses, uh, including business math, macroeconomics, public speaking, business fundamentals, but there's um, a lot of technical courses as well around data analytics, um, machine learning, and then the work integrated project course. Uh, there's also technology ethics and society, as well as technology business strategy and execution. Uh, and, and again, those are to meet the needs of those smaller and medium businesses who are employing machine learning analysts. So this is the first poll I have up as part of the Minty. And unfortunately, uh, this menu here is actually cutting off the Minty code. Um, let's see here, I can find the code for you. So if you go to menti.com and type in 489830589830058, you can go to the poll and fill it out. And so the question is, what do you think a machine learning analyst would do? So this is someone who doesn't have a degree or a four-year degree. They don't have, um, oh, thanks, Swan. Uh, they don't have a master's, but they have those um, data analytics skills. They know how to identify a machine learning model and train it and they understand the business solution. So what do you think they would do? So just type some uh, kind of keywords in to the mentee. And once uh, a few people enter the results, it'll start to show up here. So track results, test, determine if it succeeded, keep good data, data cleaning, analyze data, 
quality assurance, make algorithms, regression. Yeah, these are pretty much all aligned with what we're thinking. Um, it's interesting in the post-secondary world, there's still a lot of institutions who are creating data analytics programs. So whether they're diplomas or degrees or certificates um, around data analysis. Uh, however, we're approaching it from more so the point that machine learning is kind of the future of data analysis. They go hand in hand. Um, we are also doing a uh, data analyst micro-credential, which is a series of workshops for fundamentals, but this is kind of what we're thinking. Is, does any of this surprise anyone? And you can unmute yourself or you can, uh, if you're in the mentee, there's also the option to add comments as well. I'm curious to see if they, if we have any uh, people with ML analyst experience in the room that might uh, be able to uh, sp speak on that experience. But perhaps there is. That's all right. I'm trying to pull up the mentee because it's not showing me the. So this is kind of, yeah, this is all in keeping with what we're looking at. So a lot of it is around data analytics, but also uh, looking at those algorithms, training those algorithms. Uh, but one thing that they won't do as part of this program is writing the algorithms, but they'll be able to uh, identify them, identify the parts of the algorithms that are important or even make modifications to them. So, uh, but in terms of actually writing algorithms or making um, complex algorithms, at least we usually from industry, we're hearing that that's more of a four-year degree, if not a master's degree type skill. So the first uh, cohort for our programs, so the first run through starts January, 2022. It's an off cycle start, which means that it's not following the normal September, fall, winter type program schedule. Um, however, the following cohorts will be September and then January or fall, winter, fall, winter, which is normal for post-secondary. Um, however, it is four terms in a row. So it goes for 16 months straight. Um, there's no spring summer break like you would usually see in post-secondary. And this is because for the first cohort, we have a lot of interest um, and are targeting more mature learners who are pivoting into tech. Um, these are a lot of uh, workers who are looking or businesses trying to future-proof their workforce or uh, develop more competitive solutions as they come out of the pandemic. Uh, so we're not, it's not necessarily geared towards high school learners, but everyone at the same time is welcome to apply. Um, the average age for a Northwest student is between 26 and 32, depending on the program. So it's generally who we cater to anyway. Um, when you look at machine learning programs or any like type kind of data or technical based program, there's a lot of training for the technical side or the tech skills and those business fundamentals. However, there's no domain specific training. So we're not training for, uh, for example, like we don't have healthcare courses in our program architecture. So that someone coming out of it would be a data analyst in healthcare. Those skills come separately, but a nurse could take our program, learn those skills, and then go be a data analyst or a machine learning analyst in healthcare. So that's kind of who we're targeting for that first cohort is uh, someone that already has some sort of domain knowledge whether that's health or finance, et cetera, and then training them on machine learning. We also have a combination of in-person and high flex learning, and I'll share what high flex means in a second. And in the fourth term for the first cohort, we're actually trying to uh, finalize an exchange program with a technical institute in the European Union, where our students will work with their students to actually develop uh, software using a machine learning model that they create. And then the students at the EU Institute will actually code the program and develop the software, which is pretty cool. So in a lot of tech programs, you see uh, co-ops or internships, et cetera. 
But what we're hearing at the diploma level is that businesses, they don't have the resources to support co-op or interns. So instead we have a work, a machine learning work integrated project, which is a project-based course under the mentorship of businesses and industry. This allows industry to participate on their own terms with the types of projects. It exposes learners to different domain experts, so they don't have to specialize in either health or finance for certain projects they can actually choose. And then students also will be able to create a portfolio of work and network with industry. Um, and the biggest thing about this being an actual course and not a cooperate internship is that it's completely inclusive. So everyone in the program will be able to participate and benefit from it versus less than a quarter of the students usually being able to get the co-op due to the competitive nature of tech co-ops. So this is based on, this is a really crude diagram and I apologize, but it's based on what we saw during our stakeholder engagement section uh, session. So when you're looking at data analytics and machine learning, you're generally looking at everything up from data collection, um, including looking at for sources of data, store how to store the data, and then go to processing it, analyzing it, and then generating the machine learning model. Um, our program does everything up to the machine learning modeling point, uh, starting with web code and app building, that's more software development, um, and same with deployment, and that is going to be beyond the scope of this program. So we're focusing on everything up to the machine learning model, and that includes um, identifying the algorithm and training the model, testing it, et cetera ensuring that it also answers the right business question using the right data. So this is the second poll question, and it's which domains do you think will use machine learning the most? So in the next few years, what are the industries or domains that are really going to um, exceed at using machine learning? So I just checked the Q&A and someone's asking, would this be appropriate for someone working 40 plus hours? And because of our um, high flex program, you could probably make it work. In post-secondary, if you have a full course load, generally you're looking at 40, 35 hours a week between courses and studying. In a technical program, you see a lot of labs as well. So there might be uh, days where you have eight hours of lectures and labs to catch up on or watch. So if you want to do that to yourself, <laughs> no one can stop you. Um, I don't recommend it though. However, if you do have a, um, a post-secondary education or a training and you think that you could challenge those exams or transfer your credits, those are also options as well. And we can always help you figure out what that looks like. All right, so most people believe that finance is going to be the one that uses it the most, which is really cool. I don't know if you know this, but for example, ATB, they consider themselves a tech company in the finance space and not a finance company with tech. Um, and so we're seeing a lot more um, need around finance and data, financial tech, all of those good things. Um, healthcare and manufacturing being second is really good to see. Healthcare is an interesting one. Uh, because it's regulated, it's been difficult to get into that space, uh, but manufacturing is pretty exciting. And then energy, digital media, and other. The person who said other, what do you mean by other? Can you include it in the chat or the Q&A or comment? If you hit the comment button, it'll just pop up. Uh, well, I don't know uh, who, who did uh, mention other, but I can see um, the uh, we working we're working a lot in the agriculture space as well, so we can see mm -hmm. uh, machine learning being used there, um, uh, and 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 also the sort of uh, food science sort of uh, uh, realm of things where um, I can see microbiology uh, uh, sort of utilizing these tools going forward. Yeah, those are great examples. Cool. Um, so what is HyFlex? So I've said it a few times. So HyFlex is essentially a three-in-one course modality. So when we teach HyFlex, 
perhaps um, your instructors in class with some students in class, but there are also students who attend remotely live or synchronously. Um, but the lecture is also recorded and then the instructor provides asynchronous learning as well. So if you miss that lecture or you can't make it, then you can watch it online later and the instructor will have uh, ways for you to engage with the content remotely. Like for example, a Mentimeter or um, we use HTML5 to actually code uh, videos and assignments within the lecture videos themselves. So it's really great because learners are able to um, participate in their learning or engage in it um, based on what their needs are. We are targeting um, women who return to STEM as well, which can be really hard when you have children to care for or childcare, or maybe you have a job and you can't make it to daytime classes. This is how everyone can still participate and get their education. Same quality education, no matter how you attend. Um, however, you always have the choice and that's class from class to class. Maybe you attend one day, maybe you attend virtually another day, maybe you miss it all together and catch up on the weekend another day. It's totally up to you. Um, and as part of this, we're generating more courses with case-based on authentic assessment. So that's, that means moving away from things like multiple choice questions or like really long and tedious exams and instead making it portfolio or project-based work, which is what tech should be to begin with. I don't know about you guys, but when I took computing science, I had to write my exam, put the, piece, put the pencil on a piece of paper, writing out code. It was shocking to do that. And I think there's some instructors who still do that. We will not do that at Northwest. So I have a video about HyFlex. Um, it's about a minute or two long. Um, I don't know, does, is there interest in seeing it? Like, do you understand kind of the concept? If not, I can show the video quickly. Alternatively, we can also uh, pop the uh, link in the chat and people can also uh, peruse I can't share the chat. link for this one because it's an internal huh. video. Understood. Yeah. Uh, it looks like um, it, it looks like the uh, Brad is saying that uh, there's some understanding there. Does anybody uh, is anybody really uh, wanting to watch this video? That's okay. We'll You're skip right? it. Yeah. I just thought I'd include it just in case. But yeah. So we don't want to make a technology program that doesn't take advantage of the fact that it is a technology program. So we're working really hard as the AI Pathways Partnership, but at Norquest in general, to ensure that we include, that we're inclusive and that we promote equity, diversity and inclusion as part of our programs. Uh, we have, for example, the 1000 Women for a STEM campaign, where we're raising money to give out $20,000 awards to women to pursue STEM education. And this is one of the that qualifies and includes money for childcare as well as mentorship opportunities with other women in the profession. We have the Autism Cantech program with the RoboCoach so that uh, youth who are on the autism spectrum are able to train for a digital career and also transition to the workplace effectively. And we're currently working with the Autism Cantech experts to see how we can then um, transition some of those learners into machine learning careers as well. We have the Inclusive Will Projects where all learners will qualify and they'll, they'll all have equal access to industry. It's not just the five people who get the co-op, it's everybody. We have the HyFlex Learning, so learner supports and accommodations are built into it uh, or the pedagogy or uh, teaching style. And that, so for example, if someone who um, uh, has trouble hearing or like visual uh, differences, then we can have those accommodations built right into the classroom and how we teach. It's actually a very small step to, uh, once you have a high flex classroom, it's a very small step to bring it up to ensuring everyone is accommodated and has access to the content. And then something we're working really hard on is anti-racism as part of our curriculum. 
So that includes indigenization of curriculum, but also learning to identify bias. Uh, and actually there's courses where that teach like identifying bias and machine learning and data collection all the way down to training the models, but also from a business process perspective as well and how um, everything from anti-racism and racial bias affects outcomes of what you're doing from both a business and machine learning model perspective, um, but also in other areas like gender, um, like gender neutrality, uh, ensuring that there's some bias against any gender, et cetera, uh, which if you read the news, a lot of the recent problems in AI um, where things go wrong are actually um, the result of bias in those instruments like the Amazon hiring tool that was actually biased against women. They used it for a little bit of time and then had to not use it after investing all those resources into making the tool. Um, that was a few years ago already, but uh, we're trying to ensure that our training is up to date for everybody um, and includes a modern perspective on who's going to be developing these tools and using them. So I see there's another question. So someone says, I mentioned the co-op work at the EU, but are there other mentorship avenues that are accessible in Edmonton while taking the program? Absolutely. And so that is, we actually have uh, several industry partners that are already part of our partnership and they will be helping us develop content with Amy for our uh, work integrated project courses and other curriculum that we're developing for this diploma program. We're also working with tech accelerators um, and the government so that anyone who wants to start a business based on what they learn will have the resources to kind of get up, get on the ground running or understand like what other resources they can access like funding. Um, yeah, we're building it. And then we're building an entirely separate mentorship program that is exclusively focused on mentorship for students with industry participants or volunteers. So if someone's interested in the course, but you have to convince your boss, do you have any resources, templates that you can use to convince to pay for the participation of the course? That is a great question. Um, because it is a diploma, I don't actually know like how that works for um, industry or bosses paying it. Um, usually that's part of like your um, benefits from work. So it's totally dependent on your workplace, what's required. If you go to norquest.ca slash MLA, that's where all of the program um, details are, including all the course listings with descriptions. Um, you, all of the information is there. If you do have more questions or need more specific information, then you can always get in touch with us and I'm happy to provide you with that information. So if you wanna be part of the program or help contribute to it as a machine learning specialist or data specialist, we're always looking for our volunteers to join our mentorship program. Um, we'll be hiring for curriculum development, including writing business cases or putting together assessments. Um, we're working for industry support for developing um, real world business problems for the work integrated project. Uh, so if you're a business and you're interested in contributing to that curriculum or having like your own uh, business cohort, then we can support that. We also have the data analyst micro-credential coming out. So if you don't have any training in data analysis, um, then that one would qualify for the Canada Alberta job grant where your employer would be compensated for it. Um, however, I'm not sure if anyone in this group would benefit a lot from it. It's pretty fundamental data analysis and visualization. And then lastly, if you are an expert, we're always looking for experts to join our program advisory committee. We're uh, three times a year, you just provide input on the direction of the program uh, and ensuring that we align with what industry wants our learners to be able to do. So that's pretty much it. Um, yeah, questions. Yeah, nice. Thank you, Shauna. I know we've had a, a few questions being asked uh, throughout your presentation, um, but uh, I'm curious with the program, 
uh, how big are the uh, the cohort sizes looking like? Or maybe, you know, perhaps this is since this is being the first year, um, so you know, maybe this is yet to be determined. Yeah, no, it's um, so we have uh, we have it open to both domestic and international students. So we already have. Um, a lot of international interest from global companies as well. Uh, we're probably aiming for around 20 students for this first cohort, but we can accept anywhere up to 45. I just, because it starts in January, we tend not to get as many students. And then next fall, it'll probably be around 45 or more. However, in that uh, like work integrated project course, depending on the number of businesses that participate, we'll have um, the domain specific cohorts within the course. So you either join like the finance project group with ATB or energy with EPCOR, et cetera. Excellent. And, and also with these cohort sizes, will the, if you enter the course, say in January, is, is that cohort uh, yours from beginning to end? Or is, is there sort of um, a bit of a, a sort of a student swap around? I mean, with our class size maxes out between 45 and 90. So if we have less than 45 people, then you'll be with the same people throughout the program. The first year is very fundamental. So there's a lot of math. So that's when you take like your stats, calc and linear algebra, as well as some business courses uh, and English uh, credit and your intro to computing. So we're not expecting full classes for all of those because I'm sure people will come in with transfer credits. However, in the third and fourth semesters, a lot of the courses are co-requisite. So it'd be really difficult to piecemeal the program past the first year. So once you get into the third semester, then you're probably with the same people all the time. Understood, thank you. And I, I did type another uh, question into the Mentimeter here, but I, I'll just ask you here, will there be mm -hmm. opportunities in the future to take this course as a, as a part-time uh, student? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it depends on how fast the program grows. So because of changes in post-secondary funding um, and the way that we are um, bringing money and are, are allowed to spend money, um, the way it works is essentially we have to predict how many students we'll have. And it's really difficult if we do end up having more students to actually then increase class sizes but if we go too high then that also makes our lives difficult so um yeah we'll aim totally for it i mean if you apply you, if you apply if you meet the entrance requirements then you'll be fine excellent and and, and we have a question from john here around uh, tuition costs is there a link that we can uh, provide within uh, the chat here that we can uh, uh, give a bit more information about tuition and or uh, uh, any any scholarships that uh, students can apply for. Yeah, so that women first or women in STEM award is not live yet, but it will be soon. Um, otherwise, you can apply for your standard, um, like it qualifies for student aid and all the other merit based scholarships, etc. That uh, help pay for diplomas. Um, our, if you go to that link that you shared, all the tuition and summaries are there. So for domestic students for the uh, four terms, it comes to just under 17,000. And then international is just over 36. Awesome. Do we have any more questions for Shauna? Last chance. Thanks for sticking around to watch the whole thing. No, it was great. And it's, it's, it's actually really great that um, more of these uh, opportunities are available. Um, many people have different, you know, life, uh, you know, lifestyles, they have different sort of um, restrictions that, you know, whether it's childcare and opportunities like this that help increase the accessibility of uh, continuous learning is is always excellent. So thank you mm -hmm. for, for, for coming by and, and sharing uh, all this information. Um, and uh, if there aren't any more questions, we can uh, we can give Shauna a big round of applause uh, for sharing all the expertise mm -hmm. and and time. Thank uh, you. This this evening, yeah, wonderful. Um, so uh, you know we're we're at six oh eight right now, uh, and uh, if 
anybody else doesn't have any more questions, we're happy to uh, conclude the uh, this June edition of the AI meetup. Um, so with that, um, uh, Brittany, if you are, uh, if you could please uh, put up that last slide. Uh, uh, at, on behalf of Amy, we would uh, like to thank you all uh, for for coming. You know, these uh, events like this wouldn't exist without. Uh, uh, you, our community, uh, not just our, our, our speakers that bring forth the expertise, but also our participants that come with uh, a, a, a curious mind who would like to learn a little bit more about the work that's being done in the AI uh, sector here in Edmonton, Calgary, and Alberta. So uh, thank you, first and foremost. Um, again, this meetup, uh, since it's being recorded, it will be put up on our YouTube page uh, coming soon. And that being said, we also uh, have uh, a ton of content on uh, the Amy YouTube page. And Brittany, if you could uh, help me out here by uh, putting that YouTube link into the chat for people to access. You can find not just past meetups, but also technical presentations being uh, hosted at the University of Alberta through the AI seminars and the Tea Time Talks, as well as other past lectures that we've hosted. There's lots of content there to explore. Um, and we'll make sure that uh, you have uh, plenty to peruse bef uh, before you go today. Um, that being said, we do hope to see you again next month at our July meetup that will, uh, that will be happening on July 22nd. Once again, uh, thank you to our presenters for sharing their time. Faraz, Nirav, Shana, do you have any uh, final words you would like to say before we go as I look for the YouTube link? <laughs> I'm, uh, I will just pop my email into the chat. So if anyone wants to get in touch with me directly about the program or other opportunities as part of the partnership, you can get in touch with me there. Excellent. All right then. Well, you know, thanks Thanks a lot for coming by. Uh, we wish you uh, all the best here. I'm gonna put this YouTube link here before I forget. <laughs> it's okay, Brittany. I know you're very busy on your end doing all the social media for this event, so a-okay. Nirav, uh, uh, Faraz, uh, and, and, and I believe Graham, you might still be here. Uh, thank you for Entwist as well for coming, and, and for Northwest, and uh, we wish you all the best in the coming month. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great summer, everybody.